Father, I thank you that today you are moving us, God. God, I thank you that today with all the testimonies we can give you all praise and honor and glory, God, as we, as we just step back into the place and turn our eyes upon you and the things that you are doing. And I say, thank you, Jesus. We say, thank you, Jesus, that you are a very present personal God, that you step into our moments and that you change us from the inside out. And so, Father God, I thank you that today, that as this word goes forth, Father God, that you would speak clarity over people's lives, that you would bring an excitement and an energy, Father God, that we would lean in and that we would not stay where we are, but, Father, we would move into every single thing that you want for us. And so, Father God, I thank you that today you would help me communicate this word, Father, not by my own eloquence and preparation, but by your spirit. More of you, Jesus. Father, even these testimonies, it's when you step into that place, God, that miracles happen. The supernatural takes place. And so, Father God, we put ourselves in a position, but we step out the way for you to move. Have your way today in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, um, I got to go to gym. <clears throat> for those of you who are professional gymmers, high five. But I'm going to tell you my story, okay? Because sometimes we compare our lives to people who are professionals and we never measure up. And so I'm going to talk about just the average every day because we can all relate to something in somewhere in our lives. And so I went to this gym class and it's called Body Combat. And basically what it is, is you just move every single thing in your body for about an hour. And it's like it's star jumps and boxing and kicking and squatting and bending down and then back up again and then sit-ups. And it's fast and high-paced. And just when you think, praise the Lord, we should be finished, and you turn around and you realize you've only been in there for five minutes. <laughs> Do you have a tissue, Mara? Sorry. And so what happens is this week, this coach of ours, and some of you who know, because I've been, if you've spoken to me and I've been at a class, thank you so much. Do you not need it, Mara? I might make you cry today. <laughs> I'll bring my own tissues. I will one day. And, and so what happens in this class is this lady, and if you've been around, I've told you before, this is a specific class, and it's a specific lady that teaches it. We've got Pat, and she's 60 or 70, and she's got Batman trousers. She's fantastic for Pilates, but she's not fantastic for combat. <laughs> and so this girl, her name is Tracy, she is so strong and so fit and so well built. <laughs> Do you have the picture? You don't get the picture. She's like professional in her job, okay? These gym instructors are amazing. Darren, you know, you one of them, you know, they just got it all. And they go from one class to the next class to the next class. So in any case, we get into this class, and this girl, she doesn't even know how she inspires me. So I like to go to gym, to a class where people tell me what to do. So I don't have to think about it. Just tell me, and I'll do it. And so she comes up, she goes, come on, athletes. And then immediately you're like, yeah, I'm an athlete. I'm in the back of the room, so I can't see myself in the mirror. <laughs> you don't want to see yourself in the mirror when you're doing all these things that you're not a professional at. And then she goes, we're not stopping. You can do this. Picture the enemy and take him out. I'm like, okay, okay. And then she, w and she goes, you can do it. And another blow and another squat. And then another, like, it's basically, she's like, whatever it is, what's holding you back? Don't let it hold you back. And I'm like, this is good stuff. And she has no idea that I'm just being filled at the back of the room while I'm like, you know, falling over your legs. And so this week I went to combat and it was a full, full class and she started and it was a bad class. Have you ever stepped into a class and you think, okay, I know it's hard, but I know I'll make it through it. And then you come in and they change the whole program and they make it harder. Do you know that halfway through the class, one person left, they start looking at their friends going, like, we're out. And then they pretend to go and have a water break and they don't come back in again. 
And the next minute you realize, because you can see yourself in full view in the mirror because no one else is standing in front of you. And about 15 or 20 people left the class because it was so hard. And I was like, I'm going to. With the next person that walks out, I'm also going to have a water break because I don't think I'm going to make it. And it gets to this place where she says, We've got 15 minutes left, but I mean, the first five was already too hard for me. 15 minutes, and she goes, right, plank, drop. I don't know who invented the plank. I mean, a plank is a plank. It shouldn't be a person, right? And so, she goes, drop, and then she tells you, go, okay, running man. But it's not like running man. It's like, swing your legs back and come right up, and swing your legs back and come right up. I've never done it, okay? I just want to tell you. You might be able to do a running man like, I'm like this. <laughs> running man, drop. Go out into a plank. Go into a, 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 this is all good stuff, Jolly. You'll go and take it home. Take it home with you. And you drop down into a push-up. And then it's not a normal push-up. You have to go Spider-Man, as in stretch your arm forward. This arm here, push down like that. So basically, a one-arm push-up. I'm not good at it, okay? Are you, are you picturing this? And then you change arms and you go this way and you do a one-arm push-up. And then you go into your plank up again. And then you have to move your position in the plank where you open your legs and close them and open them. And then you close them, open, close. And then you drop and you do a Spider-Man push-up and a Spider-Man push-up. Then you go back up into the plank. Who's excited about it? Who knows that I wanted to walk out? I actually just wanted to lie flat and wish they didn't see me. <laughs> But you know, that's how life could be sometimes. When you actually go into a class thinking, I know it's going to be a bit hard because it's an intense class and I've signed up for it. I know that today it might have some challenges and I'm, I'm ready for it. But then when you pitch up and the program changes and they've complicated things and they're pushing you from five minutes in before the day even got started, you're thinking, I wish it was the end. Do you know, Peter felt like that. Peter must have felt like that. Last week we ended in the Garden of Gethsemane and today I want to start in the Garden of Gethsemane where he, he finds himself in a place where Jesus says to him, not just to him, but we know what happens with Peter. He says to his disciples, this is, the time has come and it's now. And so what happens is he's, they have the Passover feast and they, he, he leads them to Gethsemane, which means the oil press. That's what it means oil press. And then he says to them, you wait here because I'm going there. Do you know God is always wanting to move us from where we are to where he wants to take us? And he says to them, wait here and I'm going there. But sometimes in those waiting processes, in the in-between, from the time you start and the time you finish, from the time things you, you think you know about to the times they start making sense, there's a lot of unknowns. And so Peter finds himself in this place where he fails. He fails at that moment when God says, if you would just lean in, you would have been able to get through the next challenge, which was the arrest, which was the denial, which was the absolute life that falls apart because that's not who he thought he was going to be. Because remember the thing about Peter is that a few weeks or months or years before it, it's the same guy that God, Jesus calls out and he goes, come and follow me, Peter, and you'll be a fisher of men. And there's conversation around who Jesus is. And Jesus says to him, okay, you've heard all these things. Who is, who is Jesus? What do you say? What, Peter, what do you say? Who am I to you? And Peter is the guy that says, you're the son of God. And he says to him, okay, Peter, you're the rock. And there's a little exchange that takes place. When you acknowledge who Jesus is and what, he, what he's come to establish on earth, he looks at you and goes, okay, now that you know that, let me tell you something about you. You're going to change the world. There's going to be mighty things that will kind of come out of your life. You're going to be a rock. You're going to be an encourager. You're going to be a person that's pushing back darkness. You're going to be that nurturer. You're going to be that encourager. You're going to be, and you lean into him. He goes, let me expose a little bit more about you. There's a scripture that says the more and more you learn about God, the more and more you learn how to do your own work. Because he starts putting those things in alignment. And so he speaks over Peter and he says to him, okay, Peter, upon this revelation of who I am, when you know who I am, Peter, I can build on your life. Not Peter, because you're so clever, I'm going to build my church. 
upon your revelation of who I am to you, I can take you places. Do you know Jesus wants to take you places? He wants to take you places. Not just, you know, you take him places. He wants to take you places that you have not ever even discovered before. And so he says to Peter, I'm going to build my church on this revelation. And then it's Passover, and he says to him, but before we get there, Peter, I just want to tell you that there's going to be some stuff that you're not going to be able to live up to. There's going to be some things that are going to just come from nowhere and feel like they've taken you out. And he says, but you know what, Peter, what I want to tell you is this. And this is what I love about how Jesus relates to us. He just tells him, Peter, I'm going to build my church on your revelation. But then a few months pass and stuff, and he says, but Peter, I just want to tell you as well that I know that you're going to battle. You're going to go through something, and you might not be able to actually you know, overcome it. But this is what's going to happen. He says, Peter, my dear friend, listen to me. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Satan has demanded to come and, visit, come and sift you like wheat and test your faith. But I have prayed for you. Do you know that God knows? what he's called you to do. And he says, I pray for you. I pray that when the enemy comes and says, you can't do this, or what you think God spoke to you is not really what he spoke to you. And he comes and shakes the very core of what Christ has spoken over your life and what Jesus has declared over your situation. And then he comes and brings just a bit of a blow. If he can move you out the way and move you off of that position of trusting him and, and eyes uh, like steadfast on who he is, he says, I'm praying for you, Peter, that you would stay faithful to me. He's saying this over Peter while he's telling him that you're going to deny me. He's saying, Peter, you're going to deny me, but I'm praying you would stay faithful. Peter, you're going to fail, but I'm praying you're going to stay faithful. And he says, remember this. He says, I'm praying for you, Peter, that you would stay faithful no matter what comes. Do you know, God says you're going to be a rock, but I'm not just going to leave you there. I'm going to give you a glimpse. You're going to be faithful. Whatever comes, something's coming. Whatever it is, Peter, don't. Don't waver. But this is the part. He says, but remember this, that after you have turned back to me and have been restored, make it your life mission to strengthen the faith of your brothers. Peter, you're going to go through some stuff that only you will be able to uh, overcome. And once you've overcome that, I'm going to use it for the glory and the power in my kingdom. So let me just remind you, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall, but then you're going to be restored. And then it's going to be way, way greater than what you ever dreamed or expected. So God takes him from there, from here to there. But in Gethsemane, he says, wait here and pray. And they fall asleep. And he's not ready for the next thing that God wants him to do. He didn't lean in. He became distracted. And so here we are. After Jesus prays in Gethsemane, we know the story. It says, Jesus led his disciples. He led them. He took them with him. He invited them to come with him to the oil press, to the garden. He says, he led them there to the oil press. He told them, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took Peter, the rock, Jacob and John with him, which in other translations, James and John. However, an intense feeling of great sorrow plunged his soul and into deep agony. And he said to them, my heart is so overwhelmed and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Stay here and keep watch with me. And then he walked a short distance away. Jesus is always going to be ahead of the game. He's always going to be a step ahead of us. He's always going to be preparing the next thing that he's going to do for us. And if we would follow and if we would stay awake and pray and we would lean in, we'd be able to step into that next season. In Gethsemane, he then moves into that place where he's so desperate for God to move because he knows in order for him to do the very next thing that God wants him to do, he needs God to do it in his life. And so he, pre he pleads and he's in agony and he's praying and he's crying out to God. And he's saying, God, I need you. I don't know how to do this. I feel like I'm about to die. I don't know what the next step is. But I'm about to uh, just, uh, you know, last week we looked at it, premature death. Don't let me die now when I haven't actually achieved the things that you've actually called me to do. 
Don't let me quit now. Don't let it come to pass that that the enemy stops the plans that you have for me. And so he says, God, and so for this next thing that needs to happen, all of me needs all of you. And how many of us know that the next thing that he needed was for God to take him through the place? We also see that Peter needed so much more in that moment for the next thing that he had to face. And so the, the army comes in and the soldiers come in and the next thing, now they're ready to fight. And they fight a battle that they weren't really meant to fight. Because straight after that comes the denial. Coming around the courtyard and Jesus is led away and somebody goes, I know you. You're that guy. You're one of those disciples. No, I'm not. He goes, I know who you are. I've seen you with him. I don't know what you're talking about. And a third time, somebody goes, you are. You've been with that Messiah. And he says, leave me alone. I'm not that person. And the cock strikes and the cock crows three times. And everything that Jesus had already spoken over him comes to remembrance and his world falls apart. See, the thing is, Jesus came to take us somewhere. He came to get our hearts and and reunite them and win them back. Not because it was a definite It was just in case we would believe. He came and he gave it everything he got just in case so that if one person could be restored to pure relationship with Jesus, no definites. He didn't even know if we would use our choice and we would use the very thing that that caused us to be separated from him because we chose something else outside of him. If we would use that still to acknowledge him or whether we would follow in the way that we've already decided as a human race. He said, but just in case there were one person, I will lay down my life. And so he had to die completely so that we could live completely. He's always ahead of the game. Wait here while I go and pray there. And so when when death comes and he's crucified and everyone thinks this is it and the enemy goes, that's it because he's here. But you know that Jesus was already there. When the enemy thought, I had overcome you and I've pushed you into a corner and you can't do anything else about it and finally the victory is mine and this is the one thing I've pursued my entire life is to be the person that, that everybody you know, um, worships and looks to me and chooses me and everything's about me and he's, he's gloating over Calvary. But Jesus was already there. He was ready in death and Hades and taking back the power of, of everything that's, of, of anything that would separate us, that would keep us bound, that would keep us in our sickness, that would keep us in our brokenness. He goes, I'm going, I've gone, and you can't hold me back. See, so Gethsemane means the oil press. The oil in the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the oil, the oil press. When it comes to the place where in an oil press nothing is left, not a pip, not a skin, just pure oil. And he invites the disciples in to Gethsemane. He goes, will you come with me until only the oil is left? When you squeeze and everything else has to die so that the the oil and, and who God is, when nothing is left but the Holy Spirit, See, Jesus took them there, and the process that happens in the oil press is a refining, is a dying, is an exchanging, so that something else would be produced in that place. And so Peter's in that place, and he falls asleep. Jesus made that decision, and so therefore, he could move on to the next thing. But Peter, Peter somehow missed the opportunity as we would read it. Peter, I'm talking about Peter, although there were so many other disciples there, because Peter was the one that Jesus said, I've spoken, I've called you, there's something in you, yet it's going to be challenged, and you might feel that you can't stand, but when you come through it, because I'm praying that you do, he's praying that whatever it is that you're facing today, you're going to come out stronger. Whatever it is that you've had to navigate in the last few years of your life, that you would actually be able to use that for his kingdom. He's praying that where the enemy has tried to crush you, steal from you, rob you, destroy you in whatever capacity he goes, it will not hold so that you can. See, because there's another time when Jesus says to them, wait here. And it's after his crucifixion. And it's after Peter went away and said, I'm going back. I'm going back fishing. Where's my boat? 
Where's the, just the easiness of it? Where's this? Because I must have been disillusioned by this thing. He says, there's another time when Jesus says, wait, wait here until. And it's actually after he's crucified, he comes back and appears to his disciples. And then he says to them, all right, hear what I'm about to say. Wait here until the Spirit comes. And so he took them to the the oil press, and they slept through it. And now he's at the place where he's saying, I'm going ahead of you. Again, you wait here because I'm going there. And he says to them, wait until. Until is a very (laughs) non-committal word. There's no time frame attached to until. It just means continuous. Until. Will you wait until God does something in your life? Will you wait until the Holy Spirit comes? Because what he wanted then in Acts 1 was, as you read the whole account of how the church was born, Jesus goes to heaven to prepare a place for us, to prepare what he's already come and, 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 and accomplished on earth. Now he's going off to the next thing that he's going to do for us because he wants us to move with him. And he says, but wait, wait here until. I wonder if Peter heard the words and in his heart going, wait, I know these words. Wait, I know that this has to be different because never again am I going to miss an opportunity when God goes, wait here until. And so he says, you need to go back to Jerusalem and wait. And so the next minute, Peter, James, John, and all the disciples, because he was not, he was not going to be the one that missed out again. Also, in that time, Peter was the one that did deny him, that went back fishing. And then he came back because he was restored. He was made whole. And then... He preached the gospel like no other person had. He built the church, tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit poured out, and he becomes one of the greatest apostles to go and walk the earth because he was restored, refined, set back into place because God had spoken something over his life. Because there's no quitting when it comes to what God wants you to do. Sheesh, jolly, aren't you glad you're not sitting there, hey? And so... Every time they gathered together, they said, is it now, God, is it now? And so the next minute they're in Jerusalem and they're waiting and they're waiting. And they weren't just the three disciples that were in the inner circle of Gethsemane. It was the disciples plus all their friends plus another 120 other people. They were like, you know what? God said, wait. And when he says, wait, something is about to happen. When he says, wait, you want to be there because he's made a promise and he will fulfill it. When he says, wait, will you wait with the weight of what he's promised? Because he says, when I've said it, I will achieve it. And so they go to Jerusalem, they're in the upper room, and that is the start of the church because they waited in anticipation, in full expectation of, I'm not going to repeat the things because you know what, devil? You told me that actually I'm no good for nothing. I questioned my calling. I questioned my purpose. I questioned questioned my identity in Christ when I denied him three times, but he came back and he said to you, no matter how hard it is, don't fail. Don't give up. Be restored. It doesn't matter what your life has looked like in that in-between period. He is praying for you to get back on track and use the very thing that took you out to be the very thing that will take him out. And that's what Jesus is preparing us for. See, Psalm 27 says, Lord, when you said to me, seek my face, my inner being responded, I will seek you with all my heart. Peter, wait here while I go. Missed it the first time, but not the second time. Wait here, Peter, I will, God. Jesus, you know I will. You said wait because something's coming, and that something will prepare me for the next thing that you want for me. And if you read the book of Acts, you can see that it was just in preparation for how God was going to build the church on his revelation of who Christ was in his life. And so he uses that, and it enthuses him, and it causes a passion to stir up with him. He's saying, I'm not going to quit, not now. I'm not going to back down. As I said, he went back fishing. Because you know what? Disappointment will do that to you. Disappointed in ourself will push you back. Failure will push you back, will take you off. Fear, fear just grips you and pushes you down so that you don't even know where you are. Confusion, how confusing. God, I don't know. 
I remember you said this, but you were there, and I was there, and then you weren't there, and then I was questioned, and how did, I don't even know how to think about this. Confusion will push you back when you can't see things clearly anymore, and you can't remember why and, and how you got to that place. Weariness. They were tired. They were worn out. They've been ministering for three years. They just had Passover. They just had life. They just had stuff. They had sleepless nights, whatever it is. Weariness. When you just don't have the energy to keep you going, he will use to pull you back. Because the Bible says, do not grow weary. Do not grow weary in doing good. And all those things have the ability to push us back. And so like Peter, in those in-between times, when you're in the class for 30 minutes and you're thinking, this is too hard to get through, when you're, when you're in your day or in the meeting or in the situation and, and you're halfway through and you actually don't know how it's going to end, it's so easy to go, you know what, actually, I'll go back fishing. I'll go back. I'll go back to where I started. And God's going, I don't want you to go back to where you started. I want you to pick up where you left off and be stronger than what it was and be more committed to it and be more convicted in it. <coughs> he invites us to move into more of him. And so they go. But this time it's different. This time there's a chance for them to move into the next thing that Jesus has in store for them. There is more. There is so much more in you. So, in an attempt not to embarrass myself, I'm going to show you something. Can you hear me? Five minutes in. I'm going to do it for you. Father man, push up. But I'm going to do it for you, not because I'm a professional. Not because I'm the pastor and I know how to do this life. Not because I'm the preacher and I need to know how to quote scriptures. Not because this is my job. Do you know my job is this, but my life is a Christian. Your job might be whatever it is. Your challenge might be whatever it is, but you are a child of God. And you've been called to do certain things in life. And so wherever you find yourself in your 60-minute class, five minutes in, and you're thinking, we should be close to the end right now, God is saying, imagine I'm Tracy. Pray for Tracy. We need her in our church, right? Come on, athletes. You've got 15 minutes left, but you actually wanted to, you know, leave five minutes in. That's me. All right. Running man, let's go. Running man. I'm going to fall over. I'm going to fall over. Drop, drop. And then it's like push up and push up. And then it's going into plank. Jolly, you wish you were you. Let me just cover myself. And then it's like open, close, open. And then it's closed, open, close. And then it's a burden. And then it's up. And then it's a running man. Because you know what, athletes, you are not here to stop. And whatever it is, you might have to change your momentum. And you might have to change your pace. But whatever it is, you cannot quit. Because there's more in you. This is Tracy. You can do this. There's five more minutes. So when the enemy says, that's it, you say, no, it's not it. And we will take it to the end because we're athletes. And we're in the team together. And you're not going to quit because quitting is not an option. Quitting is not an option when it comes to what God says. Because he says to you, Peter, whatever it is that the devil has said you cannot do, I am praying for you. And you might have 15 minutes left. Because when you push through that 15 minutes, the 15 people that have left, you will not be one of them. And so when you think you came and you thought you were going to make this, this class, and you're wishing you had more spit in your mouth because you forgot you were to bring your water. It is not because I'm a professional. By any means, I don't even know how to do a plank properly. But it's because... Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. I miss my momentum there. That's why I can't worship. I can't breathe properly. No, it's okay. Thank you, Johnny. See, because the thing is... God's spoken truth over your life. He's already told you, I'm here. Why don't I want to take you there? And when you want to give up, and he's going, you're not even halfway. It's not an option. But this is what Tracy said. 
the book of Tracy, if there was a book after Revelation. She said, you might have to change your pace. You might have to change your position. You might have to change your method. Whatever it takes. Because, you know, she didn't do it like I did it. <laughs> when you get into the rhythm, because it's a bit complicated, you know, all the things you need to do. Tolly, thank goodness we cousins in the Lord. Um, her pace is push-up. And it's push-up, 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 push-up. Mine is not even quarter of the time. Not half the time. And so she says, if you want to keep up with me, keep up with me. But she says, whatever it is, wherever you find yourself in this class, you might have to change your pace. If you can't keep up with me, change your pace. If your knuckles are sore, change the method. If, if, if you can't get up into, into a plank straight back, then bend your knees. But whatever it takes, you might have to move. You might have to maneuver. You might have to get to another place. Whatever it takes, you are not allowed to quit because quitting is not an option right now for you. And so wherever you find yourself, Garden of Gethsemane, I fell asleep. If they had moved in, if they had changed their positions, they wouldn't have become complacent and comfortable where they were, so they wouldn't have fallen asleep. But in the upper room, they did something different. They stepped up. They gathered people around them. They called in the, 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 the people. They changed their positions. They changed their method. They changed something in their heart. And when they did that, they didn't quit. And they got every single thing that Jesus had promised them because then the pouring out of the Holy Spirit happened in that upper room. What happened in Gethsemane, the oil press, was fulfilled in the upper room going, I will pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters and they will prophesy and they will lay hands on the sick and then we will see broken be restored. We would see the Jesus Christ lifted high and every single thing he promised us would take place because upon the revelation of who Jesus is, I have a plan for your life. I have a plan for your life and it's to take you there. It's to take you there. But you're going to need him more than ever, ever before. If you want to lay hands on the sick and pray for them and see them be healed, you're going to need Him. If you want to step into a moment and, and be the, the, the light and the, <coughs> excuse me, the light and the God colors, it's not going to come because you've dressed well. It's going to come because there's something in you that's different to what the world has, even if they go to designer places. It's going to be a kingdom thing. So whatever it is, if somewhere in your walk with Christ, you're at the place where you're going, I've been doing this for too long. I've been doing this for years. I've been doing this and watching people doing things. Maybe it's time for you to change your pace. Do you know, changing pace doesn't mean gearing down. Who knows when you're walking upstairs and you've got momentum and you come behind a slower person and then it's hard and you wish you could just get your momentum back. Maybe for some of you it might mean speeding up momentum. But whatever it is, change position, change method, change something, but never give up because he's taking you there. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you that today you are a God that is taking us somewhere. And in you, God, no matter what it looks like, if we just keep pushing in, and if we just stay in the class and we just allow you to keep telling us, Father, your words over us would be, come on, athletes, we are in this together. And if you want to push through, you've come too far to stop now. You've come too far to give up and throw in the towel. But if he, if he might speak into your situation going, you don't know that there's only 15 minutes left and there is more in you, athletes. There is more in you, children of God. There is more in you that I want you to become part of, to tap into, because I am going there and I need you to follow. And so therefore, press into more of me so that I can, so that you can move out the way because the next thing God has for you has to come directly from Him. The next place he wants to take you to is going to be in the middle of his presence, in the center of who he is and what he's called you to do. And so whatever it is, drop to your knees. Whatever it is, stretch out. Whatever it is, do it again. Because there is no quitting when it comes to what he has for your life. And so today we say we're in this together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.
Amen.